Brent, I believe everybody that was in the waiting room has been Good admitted. Day. So great. Thank you. Welcome. Welcome to our November 10th meeting. I'll start with roll call. John. Here. Juana. Here. Michael. Present. Neil is not with us yet, right? Correct. Okay. Grant's here. Kim? Here. All right. We will call to order and move to the flag salute. Wait for the flag to come up here. Okay. Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, well, welcome everybody. Uh, so this is the this next section is the first of two public comment opportunities. So the first one is for items that are on the agenda. And then at the end of the, towards the end of the meeting, we have a, a open open area there too. Um, I don't know, Justin, do you have an opportunity to kind of put up the the board comment protocol? Yes. And if folks uh, want to make public comment now on something that's on the agenda, please add your name and email address in the chat and we'll call on you in that order. Thanks, Justin. Um, and that, that email really helps us to respond later to make sure we get it. So we'll give it about 60 seconds. Yes, and Grant, also while we're waiting, um, we've received a, a message from Neil that he is getting a message that says it's just loading. So he's trying okay. to get into the meeting. Okay, great, thank you. I wonder if he has a phone he can just call in on while it's loading. That's what I was getting, Kim, and I had to use a phone. Okay. Sounds like maybe one or two. I will um, pass that information along to him. All right, Justin, do we have anybody in the, is that not, no public comment yet? Okay. We will move on to the uh, consent agenda. Um, so we have the minutes from our last meeting, vouchers and payroll, hiring, update salary schedule. Uh, we had the first referral bonus and the second reading of the, uh, about the policies we went over last week. Uh, any questions about any of those items on the consent agenda? If not, I would uh, entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. This is Juana. I'll move forward to consent. Ms. Thank you, Juana. Is there a second? I'll second. I'll second. Michael. Thank you, Michael. Michael seconds. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Consent agenda moves forward. All right, next item is student reports. Is Talon with us? Talon's not with us tonight. We had some communication. This is not Talon's fault <laughs> for those out there. Uh, uh, he's been busy. All right, so we'll move on to the uh, building school improvement plans. Yes. Are we gonna, Kim, are you gonna take this? Or are we gonna take this? I, I'm gonna get us started here by um, sharing a presentation. Um, thank you so much for your patience. Let me switch over. Can everybody see the screen now? Yes. Perfect. All right. So you are going to see a very um, simplified presentation of the school improvement plans, just a high level summary. Um, so each one of our building principals will share a bit about what's happening within their school related to their academic plans and their strategies, both for attendance and academics. Um, although they are, this is just a, a brief overview, um, it, uh, it um, is important for me to share with you that it represents a lot of hours of work by a lot of people. So even though the summary is, is rather brief, um, it does, um, 
encapsulate the work of a lot of teachers throughout our district in collaboration um, to set these goals and to identify strategies that they like to work on um, to help their buildings to achieve those goals. Um, as you recall, our process is to come back to you later in the spring to share progress um, made towards those goals. And so we'll be um, having our principals come back and share again later on these. I'm gonna get us started by talking about a district-wide goal. So um, we have goals in the area of academics, but we also have a district-wide goal that is related to attendance. So it's printed here for you that during the 2021-22 school year, um, students identified as chronically absent will be decreased by 10% from the 18-19 school year as measured by daily attendance. So we're going back to metrics prior to COVID and having that be our baseline and trying to reduce the number of chronically absent students by 10%. So this, rather than have every principal repeat the same goal to you because they all have this one, um, they're gonna talk about individual strategies that they'll employ at the building level. Um, but I wanted to save the time of having them each have to repeat this. So I'm gonna move on now and we are gonna start with um, Amy at Rochester Primary School. So it, I know that you all are very capable readers and in an effort to make things a little different, I've decided to provide the report in haiku form. Five syllables, seven syllables, five syllables. <clears throat> Refresh our systems. Reflect current student needs, essential standards. So that pretty much wraps up what we're gonna be doing at the primary school. We're having all of these goals that uh, the elementary and the primary have the same, but the ways we go about them will be somewhat different. As far as like refreshing our systems, we have systems in place to meet the needs of many children, tier one, tier two, and tier three. A lot of what used to be tier two, especially with our social emotional learning has become tier one because that's what they need. And in that effort, we're consistent about using our adopted curriculum, second step, for across the board tier one. The last bullet um, mentions that we're going to align in our hub, our support for the children who need a little more of tier one and aligning that with our tier two supports using a lot more of our second step materials. We have that lovely new RISE team that we're making sure that we're catching early warning signs about children who have needs outside the academics that we need to support their families in a different way and making sure we're using a systemic approach to supporting families. And then the whole idea about you know kids and coming to school, mostly at the primary level, the children don't have choice about coming to school. Their moms and dads put them in the car or on the bus and that's how it is. But just because a kid is there doesn't mean they're engaged. So we wanna make sure that our env environment is warm and inviting. So that second bullet item around the welcoming environment with a three to one ratio of positives to redirectives, we redirect a lot of kids because they're not used to being in this environment. But we gotta make sure that the last thing, the taste in their mouth is, I did these many really awesome things today. My teacher told me so. The recess supervisor told me so, the person in the hallway told me so, so that they can manage being redirected and having another approach. And as far as the academic strategies, we are really honing in on those essential standards and knowing what has been the result of such interrupted learning over the last year and a half, making sure that we've put together and taken advantage of materials that are meant to be used in these sorts of circumstances. So grateful for the work that Maggie Evans does in helping us to identify this and um, help us all learn how to teach some things a little bit differently and more effectively. And then with the math, we are really digging deep into what the standards are so that regardless of what materials we have, whether we're together or apart, that we can teach the kids the things that they do need to know to move forward. So you got a haiku and an explanation. I've been working on a limerick, but it just hasn't rhymed very well. Questions or concerns? Yeah, yeah some question. Mm -hmm. So I, I understand uh, engaging uh, students during class and during school, um, also in, inspiring them also, uh, but what is your average absenteeism from day to day? That number is so varied. And then I have to break it down to, are we talking about kids who are on this kind of absence or that kind of absence? It's been pretty high. It has been pretty high, John. No getting around it. 
would you hazard a guess? Is it like 30%, 40%? Oh, oh no, much lower than that. Much lower than that. We haven't hit 20% yet. Okay. In Good question. I that's a great question, John, and I would be happy to pull that together for all of our schools and can bring either get that to you in an email or present it at our next board meeting. We're, we're watching it carefully. Mm -hmm. uh, in addition to of, that, the goal of 10 percent, I, I honor that goal of 10 percent, then if if you know you're be at 20 percent, that goal of 10 percent is is a good goal. But it's also related to 10% of the chronically absent children, the children who meet that definition, not just total absences in a day for the children who've had these lengthy histories of non-attendance. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And chronically absent, just for clarification, is 10% of the school year. So 18 or more days in a school year would constitute a student as being chronically absent are chronically absent 10% of the time up to whatever day it is. So if we're on day 46, then if they're absent more than 4.6 days, then they would be considered chronically absent. And is that when we get the community truancy board involved or, or what does it take to get the community truancy board involved? That is a later step. But when, when we have kids who are chronically absent, yes, truancy board can be por a portion of that. Okay. Um, equation depending on the reason for the truth the absenteeism sometimes it's a very um if valid reason for their absence we've had kids who are admitted into the hospital for long periods of time for treatments of various types etc we would not be bothering them with truancy board um you know so it's a case-by-case -case basis Amy, thank you very much. Just another point of clarification for people who don't always speak um, education ease. Anything that when we say tier one, we're referencing something that is provided to each and every student within the system. So that might be if it's tier one intervention for kindergarten, it's something that every kindergartner is going to receive. If it's a tier two or tier three intervention, those are going to be um, reserved for students who just have a particular need still. They need more intervention, for example, to to learn a skill or they need more support in attending regularly. Thank you, Kim, for translating. I forget sometimes. No problem. All right, if there are no further questions, we will move on to Kelly at Grand Mount. Kim? Yes. I'm sorry, can you hear me okay? Yes. Um, I, I do wonder if you're pulling the data for now, could you look at it, um, pre-pandemic as well if yes. you're going to pull it and just it would be interesting to see the difference that way i wouldn't necessarily compare it to last year but maybe pre-pandemic right. to now and just gives us a flavor thank you you're welcome kelly available yes i'm here good evening um, so our uh, overall building goals are sim the same as the primary for general ELA and math. And then we also have our attendance goal and the strategies that we're focusing on there, as well as our academic goals. Um, I'll let you kind of read through that and I'll highlight. Um, rewards was a big focus this year. I think we mentioned it earlier at a previous board meeting that um, really breaks down the phonics and word chunking and vocabulary to really help um, boost kids in that area. A lot of the other strategies we've used in the past as well. Um, the last one mentioned around a frayer model, that may not be a term that you're familiar with, um, but it's one that our teachers use quite frequently. So if you can envision a, um, a, a piece of paper chopped into four squares, and then a circle in the middle. Um, it's, we use this a lot to build vocabulary. So if we had a new vocabulary word, we would put that in the center. Um, I'll use a science example like sedimentary rock. And then in each corner, we're gonna have some things that help us define that. So in one corner, we'd have a definition and then we'd have some characteristics. And then we give some examples like sandstone shale and then we give some non-examples like lava or slate. And 
So when ki the kids are filling those out in kid friendly terms, and so that really helps to build um, vocabulary and to help with comprehension, of course. So um, I wanted to kind of highlight that because Freyer model isn't something we use in everyday life. So these are um, skills we're just working on and focusing on to help um, build our kids up. And then of course, you've heard a lot about the RISE team in previous meetings that we look for when we have these um, early concerns. John asked about truancy board and our goal is to intervene before we get to that point so that we can figure out what's going on. What's the root of the problem that's keeping kids from being at school and whether we need some counseling support because it's a cell issue, social emotional issue or um, family situation at home, whatever it is. Um, if we can't figure that out at the building level and intervene, we reach out and have our RISE team come in and give some extra support. And then offering celebrations, um, not in a traditional way around, you know, having to be at school, but celebrating the growth and really celebrating those targeted kids that we talked about with Amy's RPS building is really targeting those kids that aren't coming to school and celebrate when we start getting them there in that basic reward the good behavior so we can get them there more often, make, help them want to be at school. And then of course, all that work we're doing around equity and a sense of belonging, that kids will wanna get up and ask their parents to come to school. So that's kind of it, kind of piggybacks on what the primary is doing and then next steps up. Any questions about any of that? Thank you, Kelly. Okay, thank you. Moving on to the middle school. Is Will available? I'm ready. Absolutely. Right. So thanks for the opportunity to share a little bit here. Uh, I'm not going to read a lot of this stuff. I'm hoping to, I'm going to take it in a little bit of a different direction. But first, let me talk a little bit about attendance. And I will highlight um, just the ability to use a student success coordinator to monitor more students more easily and to make those connections at home, you know, from the school setting. Um, kind of like Kelly and Amy talked about, we've focused a lot on positive interactions with kids and utilizing things like what we call warrior points. Um, and so kids get kind of got you doing good things and those are warrior points. And then we have little warrior point auctions. We have warrior point sales. Sometimes I'm waiting out at the buses selling off bags of chips, warrior points or pencils for warrior point or something like that. Uh, and so that's a good time and it gets kids interested in that sort of thing. Uh, for our kids that are absent for whatever reason, um, for our kids that are gonna be gone for you know three days or more, we have EAs giving them a couple of phone calls a week saying, how are you doing? Are there things that we can help you out with? And we also have a Friday afternoon Zoom that opens up and we have multiple EAs that will open up a Zoom for our students so that they can check in and get some help um, on a Zoom. Uh, and again, just trying to not only to re-engage them, but to help them to not be frustrated and feel like, you know, I don't want to come back to school. Hey, you know, I'm better off. No, you know, we want you to come back to school and we're going to do our best to keep you up to speed, you know, in that process. And we've been using the RISE team as well. Uh, there was a RISE referral this afternoon that was just about to get made. And, um, that's been great. Um, flipping over to the academic side. Well, conveniently, first quarter, and we're on the quarter system, our first quarter is over. And grades were due to be turned in uh, yesterday. So I got some grade reports today. Our goal there is to have our students average 5.25 passing out of six content classes. And I can tell you that for the first quarter, we reached 5.45 classes out of six out of six, which was awesome. Our students passed 91% of their classes. Um, and, and a lot of times we focus on Fs, things like that, but I can also tell you that we had almost 51% of our students earn honor roll status. That means they had a 3.25 GPA or better. So almost 51% of our students, that's 234 students that we had that made honor roll. And we did have 141 students that got at least one F and we are going to be working on those kids as best as best as we possibly can. Um, but that number is way down from the fourth quarter of last year and we're pretty happy about that. 
And are there any questions? Thank you, Will. Any questions, board members? Not I. Thank you. It sounds well, like before, you before you guys go, Saturday the 20th from noon to two, drive through feast. Mm -hmm. There's my other presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Will. Moving on to Mike at the high school. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, thank you. A lot of the same interventions are are being done in our building as well, but I'm gonna I'm gonna dive into a few of them. Um, around our attendance strategies, uh, we are really kind of getting back to uh, the basics. So uh, expectations at the school, and um, really talking to kids, uh, families, staff, and our community about uh, what are our shared expectations. So you'll see something in here around positive. Uh, behavioral interventions and supports. And really what that is, is coming to an agreement with our community about what we expect um, from our from each other and how we interact with each other, uh, but also like how do we create most ideal conditions for kids to learn? So uh, obviously we will have kids who need more support. So you'll see some tier two interventions. Um, right now we, we already have 65 uh, freshmen and sophomore students who need additional support. So we have a uh, wonderful, a support system with Pam Johnson and Lisa Wilson who intervene with these uh, young students. Uh, and then we also have students who need tier three support. So uh, these are programs that you've kind of heard already, some some rise team programs, some individual individual interventions for for kids. So uh, really around our, our big scale attendance strategy is really starting to develop uh, a culture for what it's like to be in school and what it means to be a student at Rochester High School and starting to develop that that sense of belonging and support and motivation and inspiration to make sure kids can make it across the line. So on the academic side, um, I've given you some numbers here, right? So one of the trick, one of the tricky things at the high school level, uh, especially with a school our size, is our departments often teach different things, right? So uh, a social studies department, one teacher might teach U.S. history or world history or civics. So it's how to really help these teachers align towards a common goal. So for our ELA and our social studies department, they, are, they have lined around argumentative writing. So uh, the, the state assesses argumentative writing. Uh, every English teacher assigns argumentative writing. And it's really important for students to be able to articulate how they feel about a certain top topic and support their feelings with uh, you know, research and, and, um, and viable information. Uh, so they gave a benchmark. Uh, roughly right now, 26% of students are meeting standard. Uh, the goal for each of these departments is 85% of students will meet standard on benchmarks, right? So we're not too far off. Uh, in For the beginning of the year, we're not too far off. Uh, in mathematics, we are focusing on standards of mathematical pra practice three and six, which is uh, the ability to construct viable arguments and then attending to precision. So for... Uh, Standard mathematical six, which is attending to precision, 13% of our students are currently meeting standard, and then constructing viable arguments, 23% uh, of our students are meeting standard. And you'll see a theme here for our science and career and technical education. They're also focusing on claim evidence and reasoning. So argumentative writing, uh, constructing viable arguments, claims evidence reasoning. So, so the idea here is that all of our departments are working together to support kids and how they are able to articulate their learning and support their findings no matter what subject matter they're in. Obviously in math and science, that's a little bit more of a technical writing and ELA and social studies is more of a persuasive type of writing. Uh, but it's, it's really important that they see us working together and trying to support one another. So uh, through this, there's lots of interventions that uh, the departments are building. Uh, to, to increase student achievement. Uh, and they're also looking at individual, um, individual subpopulations of students who might need additional supports for, uh, for their learning. Uh, and then also here at the bottom, we're also doing some things with our teachers to, to develop their professional development. So uh, we, uh, Christy Martin is, our, um, is our, our learning coach. She's our math and science coach. She is developing protocols for teachers basically to get out of their classrooms and go see each other teach, right? Which is, sounds like a really simple thing, but it's really valuable because oftentimes teachers, they, they don't have the opportunity to see other experts do their trade. So this is in-house professional development that allows them to grow in a really safe environment where they can start asking their colleagues about best practices. 
And just a point of clarification, these percentages that you see here of attainment of the goal, that these are students or the percentage of people who've already met the end of the year goal. Correct. So we would not expect these numbers to be high at this point of the year. So if no, we, we will expect those numbers to be at 85% at the end of the year. At the end of the year, yeah. Questions for Mike? Mike, do you find that over the um, re-engaging a lot of the high school students um, after the past 17, 18 months, I know with a lot of businesses um, that during that time they cut back hours and, and people didn't work as much, work from home and such. Um, how is it re-engaging a lot of the high school students? Um, is it just like going back and they're yay, re-engaged or is it, wow, this is, this is a little bit more uh, challenging than I thought? Yeah, so we had some really interesting things that came out through our data, John, and that, that's a really good question. So what you would typically see in, in data like this in an education is you would see, you know, freshmen here, sophomores here, juniors here, seniors here, and um, this data looks different. So what you see is a more, a more of a flat line. And a lot of that has to do with the daily supports kids get inside of a classroom and the daily scaffolding that they have between, between educators. And that just didn't exist in the same capacity as it existed. So um, a lot of our interventions or a lot of the programs that we are creating aren't gonna be targeted towards, let's say underclass people or you know, upper class people, but it's really across the board. Here are kind of where our kids are all at right now. And they're having to go back and reteach a lot of these essential skills and essential standards, but it's it's worth the time. It's the right work to do. So yeah, to, to answer your question, yeah, there there is a little bit of a, a gap there since um, coming back. And I think that um, building up rigor to attend to be attentive all day and to um, have the perseverance to to work on hard things for a full school day is something that is taking time for students from kindergarten all the way through our system to develop that, that capacity again, because they spent much less time, as you're aware, um, you know, having direct instruction. Great question. Anybody else with a question before we move on? Hey, Michael, it's Grant. Uh, question about the 65 freshmen who demonstrate at-risk ac academic behaviors. What are, are there more specifics around that academic behavior? Yeah, so um, so we have the ability to see kind of how kids have always done in, in public school, right? If they've ever been in public school, we can see here's, here's the trends, here's the data, right? So uh, we pulled data looking back all the way back to third grade for our, for our students, right? And um, we took a look at students who were uh, always struggling in math, always struggling in English, uh, did not require uh, any type of specialized program for education. So kids who maybe weren't identified as needing ad additional assistance who also still struggled, right? So when you, when you see this pattern over years, um, it would be naive to think that that same barrier wouldn't exist when they come to high school, right? So we try to do pre-intervention with these kids. So what that means is we, we have staff who meet with these kids on a weekly basis. And, and really the intervention is around executive functioning. So organization, time management, uh, motivation, and a lot of times, uh, you know, checking in and checking out with their parents, making sure the communication is 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 uh, successful between home and the school, and really providing a, a an intensive level of support for these kids. So it's it's trying to make sure they never fall into that hole, so they don't have to dig themselves out anywhere. That we can just give them the support before they you know before they need it. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, one other question. Um, you did a great job uh, describing the peer observation cycle and the, the benefits there. What, what does ITLS stand for? Yeah, so that's that's our instructional team leader. So our, our department heads. Thank yeah. you. And Thank worries. You. Lots of lots of acronyms. Yeah. Lots of educational jargon and acronyms. That's for sure. Anyone else? Hart High School. All right, I gotta keep on going. So you folks are gonna hear me say this and again and again every time I have an opportunity to talk about Hart. Um, Hart is an asset-based school and the kids who go to Hart are brilliant. They are, they are some of the smartest students in our district. 
Um, they're dedicated. They work hard towards their goals. They know what they want and they know how to achieve it, which is uh, unique for people their age, right? So um, our goal at Hart High School is to continue the great success that we had last year. We had significant numbers of students graduate and significant numbers of students complete credits. Uh, that's attributed to the, the staff that we have working with those kids on a daily basis. So uh, Ms. Kalika is now hired there. We have Natalia and Troy and Paul who really work with these kids on um, A, getting to know them and providing the support they need, but also removing barriers for kids, right? So to make sure that they're successful. Um, we are really making sure that our, our kids are trying to earn as much credit as possible and really helping kids where, where they need the most help. Um, some of our kids do need individualized interventions, but um, you know th those are few and far between. Most of our kids are, are doing really well there and are rising to the occasion. Uh, right now, our enrollment numbers are starting to go up. We have, uh, we're constantly having interviews to get more kids there, but really we're, we're trying to maintain the wonderful success and the wonderful program that has been in place at Hart High School for a very long time. Um, so we are, we're still working really hard and kids are being successful. We're really proud of them. Thank you. All right, and thank you. So um, we'll be excited to come back to you with school improvement plan um, progress in the springtime to let you know how our students are doing towards these goals. Um, again, for those who are a little bit newer to the board, um, and there's been a lot that has happened since your, you know, some of your time on the board. Um, just a reminder that we ask our our buildings to set. Um, stretch goals, not, not goals that we think are going to be really easy to attain, but goals who, that, are, that are hard to achieve. And so I always say that because um, educators are really, um, they, they want to meet expectation at all times. And so it's hard for them to set goals that they aren't 100% confident they're going to be able to reach. And so we reassure them always that the board would much rather have you set a lofty goal and not reach it than set a goal that is super easy and not have a lot of effort put forth and by, you know, by students in order to be able to, to progress. So anyway, I remind you of that and we will be excited to come back in the springtime. Thanks, Kim. All right, we'll move on to our next item, management reports, and our maintenance director, Ed Dowell, an update. Good evening. Yeah, um, I'll start with some of the things that we've completed since we last met. Um, we've completed our rest property line fence, uh, the six foot fence that runs on the west side of the property that connects the maintenance shop to the GMES. Uh, it cleans up that side of the property really nicely. We've installed the new gym scoreboards in the high school. Um, they, they're nice looking compared to what was up there. Um, we've got, we re-rocked the uh, GMES parent loop. Uh, it's the loop that we designed to keep traffic off of backing up on James Road. So they literally come through the field. Um, we tried to not put in a robust to grade road from the beginning, because hopefully that will return to be mowed field someday. But um, so it requires rocking it every once in a while because it's amazing how many parents come to RPS and or to, uh, RPS and GMS with picking up and dropping off kids. The, the traffic is incredible. Um, we're currently working on assembling the new sideline covers for the high school. Um, we're running our debris and leaf extractor daily on the leaves at all schools. Um, working on and installing drainage systems in critical areas as needed in all schools. Uh, some examples of that are the baseball storage shed. We're putting a drainage system around that to keep the water away from the, the shed. Um, main storm ditch at the high school. Uh, parking lots in the playground areas are just completely getting saturated with all this sideways rain we've been getting. Um, <clears throat> we're repairing the lights in the high school gym. Um, <clears throat> Upcoming things we got is trying to get the new footing put in the engineered wood products for the playgrounds. Um, lighting upgrades at RMS and RPS, the light poles and parking lots. And then um, hopefully we'll get the, before we meet again, we will have the new football scoreboard up and assembled. So 
weather makes that a bit of a challenge when you're running a 20,000 pound crane out into the grass. So any questions? Thank you, Ed. No, I don't have any questions. Just uh, thank you for you and your team's efforts. It's, it's really impressive. The, the, the amount of work you guys get done and, and keep up with. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for Ed? All right. Okay, thank you very much. We'll move on to business reports. Is Jill gonna walk us through those? Yep, where would you like to start? Let's just start uh, the enrollment summary for November. Okay, so um, our November count came in at 2,027.59 FTE, so we continue to grow. Um, we're about 11 over budget right now. Um, there are 66 students participating in Running Start and 34 are Running Start only. Um, heart enrollment continues to grow, to grow. we're at 26 now. Um, the Rochester Virtual Academy stayed at four. Um, the SPED count at 286, and there were 10 students eligible to be counted for the gravity program. Okay. Uh, how about the student FTE trends? So the 21-22 school year is the dark blue on the bottom, um, but it's projecting in the right direction. We continue to go up. Um, I'm hoping next month it might cross that green line. Yeah, that's great. Okay, all fun summary. Um, so at the end of October, our general fund was at just over 5.5 5 million, capital projects at 3.2, debt service fund at 1.6, ASB at 520,000, and transportation vehicle at 139,000. And then the budget status for October. Um, so at the end of October, the fiscal year was 16.67% of the year complete. Our revenues are at 16.6 and our expenditures at 15.7. Okay. And then the last one, the monthly board report for October. Yep. So um, October is one of those months when we get our, the first half of our levy payment. Um, so we see the increase in fund balance. The breakdown of that is 383,000 is restricted for carryover revenues, uh, 2.8 million committed to the board fund balance policy, 1.9 million restricted to the local sub fund, leaving just over 371,000 of unreserved. Okay. Thanks, Jill. Any questions for Jill? All right, thank you very much. You're welcome. Next up is administrative reports. Uh, we'll start with starting with Justin. We'll start with me. So I think uh, it seems like it hasn't been long since I just reported to you guys. But uh, in that short amount of a couple of weeks, um, I think one of the one of the larger projects that Maggie and I have been working on uh, in uh, conjunction with uh, instructional coaches uh, Amanda Patton, Carrie Black, and um, uh, Diane Fast has been a what, what we call champs and classroom management uh, training. Um, and so we just started that. I should say they just started that as Maggie and I are designing the course and um, the three coaches are actually teaching the course to, to, to teachers um, after school. And so there, there will be uh, six 90 minute sessions um, after school that uh, teachers that uh, want to come uh, learn some new things about classroom management and, and, and maybe learn to learn to bolster uh, their classroom management plans a little bit are going to ha have the ability to do that. Um, we Right now we have uh, right around 20 teachers taking advantage of that uh, and we're looking at possibly offering the course again in the spring um, after this time. But uh, so far after module one has been completed, uh, people left very happy um, and are already starting to implement things within their classroom. Um, and, and it looks, looks great. And it does take a little bit of time, but Maggie and I are thinking that, boy, once we get all these planned, uh, we will have a course that we can do um, over and over again as, as people need it. So that will be a big thing. And so that's my big thing right now that we're working on. And uh, so I'll hand it over to Kim. Thanks, Justin. Thank you. All right. I'll get started again with some pictures that I've taken in classroom visits over the last couple of weeks. 
some of our students at the primary school and elementary school hard at work and the, the group of students in the middle are getting the wiggles out. They're, they're taking a little stretch break between um, some academic activities that their teachers had planned for them. So that's always a good time to watch that. Another big activity that happened this last week was the send off of our high school football team to the district playoffs. Game didn't end as we wished it would have, but we are so proud of um, our team as we are of all of our um, fall athletes. Um, we sent golf kids to districts and cross country kids to districts and um, in a minute here, I don't know, call if it's the next slide. Oh, yes, it is. We recently learned that we have um, one of our freshman students who has qualified for the state swim tournament in the 400 or the 200 freestyle. And so we are so excited for, um, for Casey Smith, who will be um, going to the tournament on the 13th. So just a few days from now. Very cool. Couple other thing, pictures of kids again, hard at work. Um, this photograph here of students um, looks like they're doing some anatomy work there with skeleton. This was part of a PE activity. So that was part of a relay race. Students um, had to run a certain amount, do something at, you know, go three cones up and do a circle and come back and, um, work to help their team put together the skeleton. So it was a great way to incorporate um, physical activity and learning about body parts. Um, next picture is of some of our middle school students working on a science lesson. Another thing that has happened in our district since we last met is we had the privilege of um, a video workshop on Monday evening for um, any employee who wanted to participate. We had Dr. Mona Johnson, who um, works for the South Kitsap School District, um, spoke to us and this was the agenda. I'm not gonna read it to you, but it was really focused on educator well-being in this time of COVID-19 and all the changes that it has brought about, not only for them as educators, but for the students that they're serving and the parents that they're helping to support. So I wanted to share a few slides from her presentation real quickly. Um, this was a great article from the Seattle Times wondering why society went off kilter during the pandemic. And so she just spent a little bit of time helping everyone to understand that if they were feeling a little bit out of sorts, that that's a really normal pandemic reaction and that they're not alone and it's gonna be okay. So, um, you know, some of the things that she talked about was, you know, initially we were looking at the pandemic really as a viral, having viral consequences to physical health that way. But it also has had this very tremendous psychological um, impact on people around the world. And so all of those reactionary behaviors that seem to be intensified are, are natural although difficult, they're, they're natural consequences of a pandemic. So talked a little bit about that and some of the um, behaviors that people exhibit. So exaggerated anxiety, exaggerated anger, um, wishing it all away and just, you know, pretending it's not happening, all kinds of different approaches to that. I don't expect you to look to be able to see this little graph that was on that on this slide that she presented, but I wanted to talk a little bit about this that feeling of being overwhelmed and fatigued, and having to maintain this vigilance of constant change, not knowing what's going to come next, and not knowing when this pandemic is going to be over, is really caused a lot of of spikes in behavior and and, and more intensified feeling in students, in staff, in community members. Um, it, it, it is happening everywhere. And um, just really, like I said, trying to normalize that. And then the rest of the workshop really was on what do we do about it? How do we take care of ourselves? Because we know if we don't take care of ourselves as individuals, it is, we, we don't do our best work. 
and we can't serve students in a way that we would like to be able to do that. And so um, this was a synopsis slide at the end. She, she gave very specific strategies and um, suggestions that people could employ, but these were some of just the wrap it up things. And um, that it, it's gonna be a little bit longer. We have to continue to work through this, um, but to, to be, take time to be aware of your own state of being and invest in, in your own health. And again, using those strategies that she shared with us to help regulate um, where we are as individuals so that we can bring out the best in others and remember that we're, we're all doing the best we can under these really difficult circumstances. Um, but in order for us to continue to do this work over the long haul, we need to recharge our batteries. And that means that we have to, to take time to get exercise and to get sleep and to eat well and to spend time doing things that bring us joy and expressing gratitude to, one, to other people spending time in conversation with people you love and, and enjoy spending time with. Um, all of those things help us to, to be our best selves while we're at work. So it, it was time, an hour well spent, um, great feedback from the staff who participated in that. Moving on, I, last time I talked with you about, a, and you accepted a donation from Pilot. Um, so I was able to go to the ribbon cutting ceremony at the Flying J um, truck stop a week or so ago. And so this, are, are there two managers who were part of that ceremony? Other thing that I reported on last time is that we would be having a visit from representative uh, Peter Abarno. And so that happened a week ago, Monday. And there was a recent article in the Cron Online um, blog that highlighted his visit to our district and some others, but some, these were some of the pictures that were taken on that day. Great visit. And I believe as a result, we are going to, um, we got some leads on some additional funding that we may be able to be, um, may be able to use to do some outside improvements. So either some playground equipment or some new tables um, outside of the high school, some various projects like that. So it was definitely time well spent. And Grant, thank you very much for representing the board. Um, as you can see from the picture up here, Jill was, was there as well as was Ed. And then um, the building principals, when we visited their buildings, they were obviously along for the tour. And the gentleman in the back, is um, a representative from facilities and construction from OSPI. And then uh, this gentleman here in the front with a blue shirt, Mitch Denning is from WOMOA, the organization that represents um, maintenance workers and advocates for school construction. Um, I brought this slide up, not because we're gonna listen to a podcast, but um, I had a really, it was the first time in the last almost two years that I've been meeting weekly with the Thurston County Health Officer, Dr. Abdomalik, when she referenced her work with the State Department of Health, that they are starting to do planning for um, post-pandemic planning. And what, what is that gonna look like? And how are they going to roll back um, mitigating strategies as the counts, be, you know, eventually get lower and lower. They realize that that's likely not going to happen until after the first of the year. But the fact that they are spending time doing that planning now is was one of the most encouraging things I've heard in a very long time. So I wanted to pass that along. We got no details whatsoever about what what benchmarks they would put in place in order to start rolling things back, but I do know that they're having those discussions. And then to wrap it up, Saturday's World Kindness Day. So I'm hopeful um, that we will have maybe, I don't know if I'll have pictures next time or not, but maybe we might be able to have some reports on some of the things that are happening within our schools in celebration of World Kindness Day. Um, I think it's, it's so important, again, to share acknowledgement of what we see in other people that we appreciate. And that is a big part of World Kindness Day. 
Any questions for me? Like the optimism, Kim. It's nice to hear that. So thank you. These days are long, but we there's a lot to be grateful for, and um, there's hope on the horizon. We're going to get through this. Thank you, Kim. All right. Next up on our agenda, uh, old business is the redistricting of the uh, board directors uh, districts. And the resolution there, we've talked about the last uh, four or five meetings uh, with the public comment last meeting. Uh, so this is uh, to formally adopt that redist redistricting. Any questions or comments about that before I ask for motion? All right, can I get a motion to approve the redistricting? redistricting? I'll, I'll move that we approve resolution 21-15, the redistrict, redistricting of director's districts. Thank you. Here's a second. This is Neil. I will second. Thank you, Neil. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Same sign. All right. Redistricting passes. All right. So we will move on to new business. And our first uh, order of new business is out of state travel. Um, we have two uh, guests here tonight uh, head boys and, and girls basketball coaches. Derek Pringle and Davina Serdal. Uh, Coach Pringle, do you want to start with the boys out of state travel request? Uh, excuse me. Um, <laughs> what do you need to know? <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad to see that you have three chaperones for 12 teenage boys. Oh, yeah. I only need one. That's just me. <laughs> So it looks like the, the Seaside Tournament, uh, December 16th through the 18th? Yeah, the 16th through the 18th. Uh, we played our first game, I think, the, at 4.30 or 5.30 on the first day on the 16th. And then the next day, depends on how well we do, it can be either 3 or 4.30. Gotcha. Good, good deal on travel. And um, Any questions, board members? Wish you the best of luck. Uh, thank you. All right. No questions. I would move to approve the out of state travel for the boys basketball team. Are you a second? All second. Thank you, John. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Thanks, coach. Good luck. All right. Thank you. All right. And the next one is uh, Coach Sertal, uh, the girls basketball team at uh, the same time, same place. Uh, tournament in uh, Seaside, different hotel. Yes, different hotel. Um, this is our second time say, uh, participating in this um, event down there. We went pre-pandemic, so it was a great opportunity for our kids to to experience um, teams from other states. Uh, we played a couple of teams from Oregon, one from California, and then one from Washington. Uh, the last time we attended. So we were hoping to attend again and they, they offered it. So we're excited for this season. Um, like Coach Pringle said, we'll have three adults traveling. Um, it'll be nice to support uh, the boys program as I'm sure they'll do likewise uh, with us um, on this trip. And um, we're just looking forward to getting back to some type of normalcy as far as um, the hardwood competition is is going to happen. So uh, we thank you for the consideration and our, our kids are going to do well with this. Thank you. Any questions for Davina? If not, I hear a motion to approve the out state travel for the girls basketball team. So moved. Thanks, Michael. Are you here a second? I'll second. Thanks, Juan. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, safe travels. Everybody Thank you, turn. we won't disappoint. <laughs> Thank you both. All right, our next item is the REA Collective Bargaining Agreement. It is exciting to um, notify you that the REA Collective Bargaining Agreement has been ratified by their membership. And after many months of hard work, um, and very collaborative work. Um, 
between our two different groups, um, we bring this to you for your consideration. This is the yep. three-year agreement, right? Three-year agreement. Right about that too. I'm sure everybody is, both sides. Yes. Kim, how was the vote on that? Was it uh, unanimous? Was it I mean, I will, 120 if, some odd teachers? If you give me just one second, I'll get you the exact count. I'm sorry, I didn't have this pulled up before. I should have thought to do that. Sorry, should be just a second. It's in here someplace. It was a high 90%. If you don't mind, I will get, when I find it, I will, will shout it out. Do you have any other questions while I'm looking for this? And if there's no other questions, can I get a motion to approve the REA collective bargaining agreement? This is Juana. I'll approve. Thanks, Juana. Do I hear a second? Oh, I know. I'm looking in my a text and I think it came via email. That's the problem. Okay. I'll I second. Know. Thanks, yeah. Michael. Thanks, Mike. Uh, any other discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 All abstain. Thank you. Any opposed? 93% yes. 7% no. With the ratification vote. Okay. Sorry for the delay. All right, uh, moving on to contracts. Uh, we have two contracts, one uh, ESD 113 staff behavior management training. Yes, so this contract is to provide support when we have individual students who um, are having challenges um, conforming to classroom expectations despite all the various interventions that our staff is um, putting into place for them. Um, this would allow somebody from ESD behavior, ESD 113's behavior support team to come in and do some individual coaching where they um, would watch that student in their school environment to try to, to um, collect some information about new things that we might be able to try. Um, another set of eyes to identify, are there any particular triggers that are causing this child to um, struggle with their behavior in the classroom environment or other places around the school, and then do some um, coaching and collaboration with those educators that would be involved in educating that student. So this is really tailored professional development, as opposed to a, a workshop that a whole bunch of people would attend. This is really about a particular child being successful in their classroom environment. Kim, I don't have attachments for the contracts. I will hope, perhaps yes. Shauna is in a position she'd be able to support us with that. I see them in my, my view. Well, maybe, let, me re, let me refresh. Let me... Okay, got them. Okay, perfect. Kim, will this be like an annual contract or is it as needed? No, it, it would be for this school year. For the school year. Thank you. Any other questions on this contract? If not, can I get a motion to approve ESD 113 staff behavior management training? This is Neil, so moved. Thanks, Neil. Can I have a second? This is Juan, I'll second. Thanks, Juan. All in favor, say aye. 
Aye. Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. The second contract, I believe this is a renewal with Morningside. It is, and there is no change in the rate. Okay. Any questions about that? If there are no questions, I'll move to approve the renewal of the Morningside contract. Do we hear a second? I'll second. Thanks, Juana. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. All right, now we move on to the REA Memorandum of Understanding, um, MOU on counseling responsibilities. Yes, as we have changed our system and we have um, had the benefit of adding um, student engagement coordinators into our middle school and high school and assistant principals at K-5, um, identifying, clarifying the roles of what responsibilities will be that of the school counselor, what will be handled by building principals in, uh, or assistant principals in K-5, um, all needs to be worked out over time. And so rather than include contract language when we were really unsure of what was going to work best in that arrangement, um, we are entering into this memorandum of understanding with our, our union to, to work through that. And so really this is just an agreement to meet regularly, quarterly, and to continually look at those roles and responsibilities and rebalance them as necessary. Thank you, any questions? If not, I would move to approve the MOU for counseling responsibilities. Do we hear a second? This is Neil, I would second that. Thank you, Neil. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Approved. All right. So next item is the resolution for uh, 2022 excise property excess property taxes and the levy certificate. It's a levy certification resolution. And Jill will speak to this. Perfect. Thank you, Jill. Yep. So um, levy certification is part of the budget process um, that happened back in July. And when I budget, um, I project what an estimated rollback would be because with the new um, laws, we're only allowed to collect 250 per thousand, um, but we don't have finalized property tax values at that time when we make that assessment. So what this resolution is doing is um, putting the amount we're going to submit to the assessor back to the 4.1 million that's approved by the voters. And they will determine the actual rollback that needs to occur so we can make sure to maximize our funding. Thanks, Jill. Mm -hmm. Any questions? If not, can I get a motion to approve the level levy certification resolution? This is Neil, I will move that. So move. Yeah. There you a second. It's Michael, I'll second. Thanks, Michael. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, passes, thank you. Next on our agenda is a first reading of policy, workforce secondary traumatic stress. So WASDA released, um, policy 5515. So this is a policy pertaining to our workforce, our personnel, and it is about secondary um, trauma and stress in the workplace. Um, so it defines what that is and it requires, and this policy is in place because of, of legislation that came out of the last session. Um, it puts in place um, a requirement for us to have a committee that would um, do a variety of things, um, primarily provide resources to staff and an assessment that staff can take to help them um, determine their level of secondary trauma and stress and um, develop action plans that would help them to combat that in the workplace. And so, uh, 
something that I would suggest or see uh, being a recommendation of this committee once formed would be to continue to do sessions like we did with Dr. Mona Johnson, making a variety of, of resources like that available to staff um, and perhaps bolstering our um, resources on our website for staff to, to use when they need. Um, perhaps doing additional um, communication about our employee, employee, employee assistance program um, reminding people on a regular basis that there are, are places to turn to to get support. Kim or Shauna, could you remind me and, and us if, what are the three there's um, under classifications? I see this is essential, but I can't remember exactly the classifications. So essential equates to, I'm thinking of the couple, the last two iterations of their, their system for labeling, it would have been priority in one of the past iterations and um, required. So this is at that highest level where we don't have discretion, whether we can have this policy or not. This is a have to policy. Um, but I, we would need Shauna's help to remember what are the other classifications. Over my tenure as a superintendent here, we've had three different classification systems and, and they kind of blend with, together in my mind. Yeah, same with me. And I can't remember what the different steps are. I thought essential was we had to, we had to pass it, but I couldn't remember yeah. what all three of them were. And then uh, discretionary, which is not so discretionary. Um, <laughs> it usually portions of it are required, but you have room to write in um, you know, more. So it, it requires a lot of district driven um, procedure to fill in kind of how that applies um, per building and then optional. So those are ones that are not required and not discretionary that um, or essential or discretionary that are usually um, more district driven decisions. Up to us. Yeah. Thank you, Shauna. You're welcome. Okay, if there are no more questions, obviously we have, if you have time between now and the next meeting, you have questions about this, please reach out. Um, we'll, this will be on the consent agenda for second reading at our next meeting. Our last night item of new business is the uh, impact fee calculations. Yes, so just a, a quick reminder, um, on an annual basis, districts are asked to recalculate their impact fees. Sometimes people know these um, formally as mitigation fees. Um, they're collected at the county level, and um, but we have some discretion about the rates. So um, we in this district use um, OAC to assist with the calculation. David McBride in particular did the work on this. There are multiple formula elements to the formula. Um, they include the facility, like current facility and property costs, um, current capacity, facility capacity within the school district, how many students do you have room for? Um, there's a student generation factor, which is um, a conglomerate of a variety of things, primarily um, enrollment counts. And um, there's a percentage of permanent facilities that you have existing in, within the school district and a, a assessment of the percentage of facilities that are temporary or importables. So that's factored in. There's an opportunity for a tax payment credit. So if a school district has outstanding bonds, um, those are factored into this calculation. The assessed average valuation for property within your the boundaries of your school district and then whether you're eligible for any state matching funds um, because of the number of what they call unhoused students, students that are beyond what our facilities have room for, permanent facilities have room for. So they take all of those factors and they calculate a um, impact fee. And so I'm gonna show my screen real quick and we can look at how those have been calculated. So um, the, if we were to use the same mitigation 
fee rate as is currently in place for the 2021 um, calendar year. Um, the rates for this coming year, 2022 would be $4,200.85 for a single family home and $2,679.04 for multiple family homes. So the, this is duplexes, et cetera. Um, and so what David has provided for consideration here is, again, the calculation at a 60% rated discount, what it would be if we rated it as 70% discount, and then the comparison. So he has for you here last year's impact fees. So you can see how they compare. And um, so the 3856 um, for a single family home. So it, the, rec the calculations for this year would represent a 9% increase if we if that was the will of the board to continue at that 60% rate and it would be 11% increase for multi multiple family homes. And the notation here is that the increases are a result of reduced SCAP eligibility, um, bond credit, and increased cost of construction. So those were the factors within the formula ch that changed. So it is the discretion of the board to determine whether we want to accept the 60% recommendation, um, look at it 70%, leave it unchanged from the current year. We could do some variation of this. Um, there's a lot of discretion. I like to see it at about 64%. 64%. Can do the math. The other thing that um, action does not need to be taken tonight. Our, our last time to be able to take action to make a change for the upcoming school year would be at our, I'm looking at the calendar. So my reference here, December, at our December 8th meeting. So right. I can do, so if you have some things like that, John, if you want me to calculate what is 64%, um, we can, I can do that and provide that to you. Yeah, I think other iterations yeah, I, that people want to see. Yeah, I like the, I like it at about a 64%. Um, and we can discuss, but yeah, I would suggest tabling it until the December 8th meeting. So it will be important if there are other um, examples that you want to have drawn up for consideration that you would get those to me soon so that I can have those prepared. And board members, basically I said the 64% because that puts us, that puts us about around last year's impact fees, a, a, a little bit less. Um, I just uh, you know, don't particularly want to be um, raising taxes. Basically what this is, is you know, um, builders building and the fees that they pay mm -hmm. so uh, which is of course is passed on to homeowners so or home buyers so that's my rationale for having it at 64 percent are there any other iterations that you'd like me to have prepared and ready for you to look at if it's this not good I was going to ask, uh, is this something we went to last year? I, I remember when we were working on the bond stuff two years ago, uh, there were considerations uh, with bond when we we're trying to do the uh, school safety improvements at the high school and the safety and security bond that had failed. Right. Uh, is this every two years or does this ha occur every year? I believe this is an every year adjustment. Okay. Shana, will you correct me if I'm wrong on that? And then, Cam, this is just yes. refresh my memory. This is for uh, people moving into our into our school district that are purchasing homes, correct? Only when there's development. Shauna, you want to do a little bit more background for them? So it's only new construction. Um, and so it's a part of the what you pay now as part of your total impact when you buy a building permit that would be residential. So this doesn't apply to commercial or any of that, this is only homes, that will, which would impact our ability to have 
the space for them to learn in. So that's where impact, you know, it's about having, um, collecting enough funds as a district to support the growth in your community that requires learning space. Okay, thank you. Other questions, suggestions? I no, I, this Michael, I would concur with uh, John's request um, and see what that looks like. I don't have any additional ones. I think we try to keep it reasonable. We want um, yeah. folks to be able to build in our area. And uh, so, yeah, no, no additional request. All right, well then I will get that calculation to you so you have plenty of time to look at it in preparation for the December 8th meeting. Thank you, Kim. I concur with John's opinion on this matter. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Okay, that brings us to um, our second uh, opportunity for public comment. Um, we've got a few names on the list already. Um, so we'll start to call those in order. If you have, if, if you're not on the list already, please enter your name and, and uh, email address. And we'll call, in, call on you in that order. Um, please try to limit your comments to three minutes. Um, we want to be as flexible as we can, but trying to make sure we can get through everyone. Um, so first up is uh, Lindsay Baker. She'll be followed by Karina Watt. All right. Good evening. I received an email from a board member and it in that email it states one of our core responsibilities is to create conditions that supports student and staff success. Physical and emotional safety is the foundation of this responsibility. If this is true, that is not what the board's actions have shown. The current conditions brought on by the district and the decisions that have been made to treat unvaccinated staff and students differently than the vaccinated does not support student and staff success or their physical and emotional safety. The superintendent informed me that the district's administration made accommodation decisions by choosing from a list OSPI put out as reasonable. I pulled the information off OSPI about the K through 12 school employee vaccination requirements. I found several interesting things there. The first thing I read was that vaccination or exemption information will be protected and the schools have protocols in place for safeguarding confidential medical information. Vaccination or exemption information will meet these requirements. By making unvaccinated staff wear N95 masks, you are not safeguarding any of the staff's confidential medical information. Anyone can walk in and pick out who has been vaccinated and who is not. The next thing under what what the next thing is under what kind of reasonable accommodations could a district provide a, an employee who receives an exemption could include, but not limited to regular testing, mandatory face coverings, increased distance between workspace and individuals. Nowhere on there does it say N95 masks are required. It says face coverings. So saying it was, uh, so saying that you are following the mandate and that is why they are required to wear N95 masks is a lie. And I absolutely hate being lied to. The district made this decision based on your own personal opinions, nothing to do with the mandate. Nowhere on the OSPI site does it say they must wear N95 masks. Your choices have created hostile conditions for unvaccinated staff that does not support staff or student success. This also does not support the foundation of this responsibility. Losing imagine amazing educators does not ensure students have emotional safety. It actually causes emotional and psychological damage to the students who bond with and depend on these educators. I work in mental health. I have seen the effects firsthand this pandemic has caused on children's men children mentally and physically. Your decisions have added to that. My job is considered healthcare, so we have to follow the Department of Health regulations under this mandate when it comes to accommodations for unvaccinated staff. And just like OSPI, it has been put in the employer's discretion 
to decide the reasonable accommodations. And I am thankful I work for an employer who does not believe in discrimination, but I am very angry, livid, and sad that my children and their classmates attend a school district that does. Things need to change and it should have changed months ago. If I do not begin to see change before Christmas break, my children will not return to Rochester School District at the first of the year. Also, just so everyone knows, 43 out of 46 voted for the REA Memorandum of Understanding. So only 35% of the members voted. Thank you, Lindsay. Next up is Karina Watt, and then followed by Josh Fluch. Superintendent Pry and board, I sincerely thank you for your service. I have no words to express the level of empathy I have for each and every one of you for leading uh, policy making during these most difficult and challenging times. The board's recent decision to suspend weekly testing of unvaccinated employees based on the criteria that weekly testing is a recommendation, not a requirement, and the voluntary test to stay program, which allows unvaccinated students who, to continue their classes after being exposed to COVID at school, confirms how we as a local community can collaboratively work together to navigate COVID-19 mandates with reasonable solutions. We thank you for listening, hearing, and responding to our concerns with corrective actions. These recent actions eliminate two acts of discrimination towards unvaccinated students and employees of RSD. It is our hope that these actions signal a continued desire to collaborate with the Rochester students, families, employees, and community members, including the continued review of the district's implementation of COVID-19 mandates. Furthermore, it is our expectation that the district board and administration will follow evidence-based decision-making in collaboration with community needs and goals regarding our children and their education. For example, what is the percentage of vaccinated staff contracting COVID-19 as compared to the unvaccinated staff since the start of the 2021-22 school year? Um, we would also expect the board to assume that an act to assume an active role in ongoing review and implementation of COVID-19 mandates to be sure they meet the following three criteria: provide equal protection equal benefits and opportunities and afford equal risks to, for the stakeholders. Those being the community, our students and families, employees and the district. We request that reasonable accommodations meet the definition of reasonable as defined under ADA law, which states reasonable accommodations enable the individual to perform the essential functions of their position while enjoying the benefits and privileges of the employment that employees without disabilities um, without a disability or 504 enjoy. I would like to remind you, the board, um, your duties as defined on the RSD website, oh, sorry, <laughs> um, that you serve as a legislative body, having final authority in all matters concerning operation of public schools. And those operations are subject to state and federal laws and regulations. I would ask each of you as board members, which branch of government do you consider yourself aligned with? Legislative? executive, judicial. When complying with COVID-19 mandates, it is your duty as a board to oversee and ensure that all stakeholders, community members, employees in the district, do not embrace compliance actions that violate stakeholders' constitutional rights, uh, Washington RCWs or WACs, by which the public schools are governed or violate the district's current policies, such as non-discrimination. For doing so would divide the community and have both short and long-term devastating impacts on the academic, physical, and social emotional health and well-being of Rochester. In the words of Desmond Tutu, we are not interested in picking up crumbs of compassion thrown from the table of someone who considers himself master. Rather, we request the full menu of rights for our children and community. I have confidence that by continuing to join hands, community, district, and employees, we can and will successfully navigate these challenges together. One last quote by an unknown author, trust because we are willing to accept the risk, not because it's safe or certain, but because, but because the stakes are too great not to. Thank you. Thank you, Karina. Next we have Josh Fluch followed by Bubba Corinto. All right, this is gonna be pretty short. Um, 
First of all, um, in this memorandum, it says last Tuesday, in response to a statewide shortage of tests, we suspended weekly testing of unvaccinated district employees. Um, how come other schools don't have that problem? Somebody just somebody just dropped the ball or what? And uh, next is discrimination. Um, in this memorandum, you say that our school district is not required to hire unvaccinated personnel. Is that not discrimination? Um, yeah. RSD does not tolerate discrimination. Well, why do our student athletes that aren't vaccinated have to test when the ones that are vaccinated have to test? Is that not discrimination? Yeah. I mean, where does it stop? Where does it stop? Thank you, Josh. Step is Bo Corinto, followed by Anna Corinto. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, got you, Bubba. Okay. Um, the suspension and testing because of your inability to source test is a convenience to you. The suspension causes more anxiety in those who you will require to test as soon as you can. If, you, if you'll suspend testing for the, your convenience and not in the requirement for the employee's mental health, it was always about punishment and retribution. I received an email from you stating that the testing of unvaccinated employees is a recommendation, not a requirement. If you actually care about the employee's mental health, you will have all the accommodations rewritten without the testing as a requirement. In the same email, you stated, our school district is not required to hire unvaccinated personnel and that you stop prioritizing vaccinated candidates in October 27th because there were no fully vaccinated or otherwise qualified candidates in the hiring pool. Yet, you're making the work environment so bad that the current employees who are qualified and passionate about the job feel the need to seek other employment. Do you think the hiring pool is gonna get any better when you make a group of people who have a common attribute wear a certain object, do you think it does not cause division? Do you think it is not segregation and discrimination? Sure, all employees can wear the KN95 mask while the unvaccinated have to. And sure, all the people could ride in the back of the bus while some had to. According to the COVID-19 vaccine requirement for K-12 employees guidance for the employers and evaluating religious accommodation requests, page two and three, in evaluating the request for accommodations, employers are not required to only consider the accommodation that the employee believes is best one. However, if an employer is not willing or able to accept the accommodation proposed by the employer or the employee, the employer must offer an alternative accommodation that is reasonable. Generally, an accommodation is unreasonable if it does not remove conflict between the workplace and the employee's need for the accommodation, discriminates against the employee, compromises the employee's access to the terms, conditions, and privileges of employment. Federal guidance recommends that if more than one accommodation is possible, the employer should offer the accommodation that is least disadvantaged to the employee's opportunities in the workplace. If the, the restrictive accommodations are not rewritten, it'll still be clearly evident that the district is more interested in punishing the educators for their beliefs than finding respectful, reasonable accommodations. Thank you, Bubba. Anne? Okay. Ann, could you start over? Okay. Hi, um, I'm Ann Parento. I'm just continuing on from the last meeting with my notes. So, okay. This has to do with the vaccine fact sheet from Pfizer BioNTech. It's for ages five through 11 years old. And you can just do a Google search, Google search and find all the fact sheets for Moderna 
Johnson and Johnson. Just type in fact sheet Pfizer, um, and it will pull up. You know everything you need to know. But um, I'm just trying to do a preemptive strike on this because nobody's talking about uh, the upcoming, most likely. Uh, vaccine rollout for the children. So um, I just want to read some of the stuff off of here that uh, will hopefully change your mind and not go through with pushing this or having vaccine clinics at the school or anything like that. Okay. In the clinical trial for ages five to 11, they received one dose of Pfizer vaccine. 3,100 individuals received that one dose. So that's your clinical trial for that. Okay, and right now the, the black box warning is myocarditis, which is inflammation of the heart, and periocarditis, inflammation of the lining of the outside of the heart, which has occurred um, which has been occurring. It hasn't, they claim it hasn't occurred in the clinical trials, but it has been occurring since. And if in, if anybody doesn't know about the VAERS database, you go to vaers.hhs.gov and um, people and doctors are reporting strokes, heart attack, blood clots, spatial paralysis, uncontrollable shaking, I mean, there's just a huge list of problems. So, and the symptoms on the fact sheet include for COVID include fever, chills, cough, shortness of breath, fatigue, muscle or body aches, headache, new loss, no, oh, new loss of taste or smell, sore throat, congestion, runny nose, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. Okay, so that's just basic cold and flu symptoms. So your child has survived COVID. If you're still, if you're hearing this, you survived COVID. So why on earth would you give somebody something that is way worse than the COVID? It just doesn't make sense. I just implore you to do research. There's so much out there. There's so many good doctors talking about the truth. Um, if you can look up Dr. Malone, he's inventor of the mRNA technology, which is in the COVID vaccine. And he is saying, don't give it to children. If he's inventor of the mRNA technology, why on earth wouldn't you listen to him? Dr. Peter McCullough, Dr. Simone Gold with American Frontline Doctors, Dr. Brian Artis, Dr. Sherry Tenpenny, Dr. Christine Northrup, Dr. Michael Yearden, just look them up, do a Google search and watch videos of what they're putting out, okay? It's gonna put you at ease. There's no reason to be fearful of COVID, okay? You can get, you could get medication for it. If you need any assistance in that, I've gotten medication. So um, my email is acorento at protonmail.com. Email me, I'll send you information on getting medication. You don't have to live in fear. There's no reason to live in fear over this. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Ann. I don't believe we have anybody else signed up. Justin, please correct me if I'm wrong there. That's it, Grant. Okay. I appreciate your time this, this evening. Uh, we are moving to an executive session next um, for 30 minutes. 30 minutes. Uh, 30 minutes. No action anticipated. No action anticipated. Um, so you're welcome to stay. Uh, but we'll go into executive session. We'll come back. We'll close the meeting. Um, Give us five minutes. May I make a suggestion that we have a short intermission before we go into executive session? Give people a yeah, stretch yeah, break. Think, can we can convene at eight ten? Yeah. Yeah. Think, think, can I add one one thing? Um, sorry, I know folks there um, that commented tonight. Uh, Certainly, certainly, I think all got the, the the letter. One of the comments, I think, Josh, uh, about the the athlete testing. So in that that email, there was also an attachment from WIAA 
describing the, the rules and requirements. And, and, and uh, so I, I'd, I'd encourage you to take a look at that. Um, it basically states that um, to be able to compete in WIA with other schools, um, we have to do the weekly testing. Um, and that, if we don't, we can't compete. Do we uh, test both vaccinated and unvaccinated grant? I, I, we do not. We test unvaccinated students, student athletes is, is the requirement. And vaccinated too? Vaccinated do not, are not required to be tested. Okay. For student athletes, yeah. So that, but that, so that's in that attachment, describes that with the WIA has been meeting uh, fairly regularly with the governor's office and Department of Health, you know, um, in, in his words, uh, with limited success, but some success, trying to keep athletics moving forward and, and available. Um, but that's where they are. They, they understand the frustration um, folks are having and, and encourage folks to share that information with the governor's office and Department of Health. So please take a look at that. I think that may help. It doesn't, it doesn't change the result. I know that's frustrating. Um, but that's the that's where if we want if we want to be able to compete with our in our league or at all, that's a that's a requirement. All right, thank you. So we'll take a five minute break and then move to executive session. Hey, ten, I will put everybody um, all the public in the in a waiting room. So if you want to wait until the uh, executive session is over, uh, if not, like Grant said, there will not be any decisions made at the end of the meeting. See you at 812. Okay. Thank you all for a great meeting. Have a wonderful Veterans Day. And uh, look forward to seeing you soon. The meeting is officially adjourned.